This is your news source evening bulletin for today, Wednesday, the 29th day of January in the year 2020. I'm Gordon Mosley, thanking you for joining us. Here's what we're tracking tonight. The Environmental Protection Agency will be moving to further increase its overall capacity to monitor the oil sector now that Guyana has officially become an oil producing nation. Budget constraints have prevented the agency from rolling out its full capacity. At a luncheon of the Ghana Manufacturing and Services Association today, the executive director of the EPA, Dr. Vincent Adams, said plans remain in place for the transformation of the EPA to better take on the challenges and concerns of the oil sector. So if everything goes well, you know, I'm hoping by the end of the year or, or next year to, for, for the petroleum unit. Like I said, next year, by next year, we're hoping to have or we'll probably at least close to our full complement of staff. Um, a new, hopefully a new building, because the, the current, where we are, is no way that it's gonna hold, hold everybody that we're gonna need to have. And then of course, proper laboratory and field equipment. Um, so it's, 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 you know, in terms of the staffing or to get enough people to go there, it's, I, would, I, I would wish that it would be by the end of this year. Um, but the rest of the stuff, to get a full complement of everything, is the earliest is next year. Dr. Adams noted that the Environmental Protection Agency has its plans and will be pushing those plans forward when budget preparations begin after the upcoming elections. He said his agency was forced to put a hold on many of its plans at the moment because of budgeting. You know, I've got a plan and I'm sure every agency head has a plan. And every agency had, has an, a ministry has a priority. And what the finance minister does is look at everybody's priority and say, here, everybody wants the sky. I could only give this, I only could give up to the clouds or something. And, you know, you could only get so much, maybe half or three quarters. So I wish I had control because there are lots of other priorities that we have not even looked at. And the Environmental Protection Agency will also be pushing for its own laboratory and specialized staff to assist it in both capacity building and greater monitoring of the oil sector. Dependent upon what my budget is. Now if I, if I like, like I said, we're not, for the first half of the year, now we've got to, 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 to ratchet down some of what we're planning for because we're only going to be getting one twelfth of last year's spending, um, which may not be a whole lot to carry us through the first six months. And then I, whatever happens in the next six months, we're going to have to figure out what to do. Um, so it, it's all going to be dependent on, upon funding. There have been calls for a great environmental monitoring of the new oil production sector in this country. More news coming up in a moment. Tired of long lines? Register with MyGTT at mygtt.co.gy. That's mygtt.co.gy to view and pay your bills from anywhere. Enter to win an Amazon gift card worth 25 US dollars or a bounty voucher worth 5,000 Guyana dollars when you sign up today. GTT, do more. Fuel it up and drive, super 95. Fuel it up and drive, super 95. Protect your fuel system, boy. High mileage and performance, boy. Guy Oil Super 95 gasoline gives you more reasons to drive and is available at 56 service stations nationwide. For affordable price, high performance, and high mileage, choose Guy Oil's Super 95 gasoline. Fuel it up and drive. All across our nation, Guyana, we see. In your lives, the future growing even stronger. GPTI, all eyes on Guyana skies as the voices of our people rise again. GPTI, Guyana's pride is in your eyes. Welcome back. 
The Global Fund organization has given a boost to Guyana's fight against tuberculosis. The organization today handed over $22.3 million to the National Coordination Coalition to support the Ministry of Public Health's effort to rid Guyana of tuberculosis. Under the new project, which will run for the next two years, work will be done in a number of regions, with particular attention being given to Regions 1 and 9. Health Minister Valdi Lawrence welcomed the initiative and the support. The Ministry of Public Health, we continue to um, seek out ways in which we can be able to achieve the objectives which we set. Um, one is the, to have TB removed from within our borders. Um, this is another show of the international bodies such as Global Fund confidence in the Ministry of Public Health um, to be able to carry out such a program. Minister Lawrence said the Ministry looks forward to the completion of the work and the report that will be furnished after the gathering of data related to tuberculosis. This goes um, hand in hand with our policy. We have said it loud and clear that we know that we do not have the capacity to do all the things that we want to do and should do, and that we will certainly work with partners, especially local partners, to achieve that goal. According to the Department of Public Information, the National Coordination Coalition has brought together more than 35 non-governmental organizations that deal with several issues from crime and violence to the reduction of HIV prevalence and gender-based violence. The executive director of that National Coordination Coalition, Simone Sills, said the organization has been doing the work across Guyana when it comes to encouraging healthy practices. We have been around for a while. We have had multiple partnerships in different forms with the ministries at varying levels. As Ms. Roberts said, um, we have been on the ground. We've been there, done that, and this partnership with the ministry is just an extension of what we have been doing, save for, um, this is the second time around, we're actually partnering on the TB project. A lot of our work is known with and in HIV and AIDS. Specific areas of focus towards ending tuberculosis in Guyana will include increased home visits and training for improved diagnostic capacity. Under the grant, the ministry will also invest in improving access to patients in targeted regions. Turning now to the telecommunications sector, in wake of an online petition calling for the full liberalization of the telecommunications sector in Guyana, the Chief Executive Officer of Digital Guyana, Gregory Dean, believes Guyanese have become sick of being left behind in the telecommunications sector. In a statement welcoming the Liberalization Now petition, which could be found on change.org, Mr. Dean said the response to the petition clearly shows that Guyanese are sick of being left behind and missing out on the opportunities that come with a digital economy. He said Guyanese are calling on all leaders to take necessary steps to eliminate the monopoly immediately and liberalize the telecommunications market so that other companies can roll out the services that Guyanese have been waiting for. Dean said he's encouraging everyone to get on board with the petition. The petition has garnered the signatures of more than 4,000 persons and the plan is to send the petition to the political parties contesting the upcoming elections by the 8th of February. According to Digicel, with the legislation ending the telephone monopoly passed over three years ago by Parliament in July 2016 and assented to by the President, there is still no progress since the legislation has not been made law. Digicel believes there is the need for the issuance of a commencement order by the minister responsible for the sector. The company has been pushing the issue as it also faces financial losses in its global operations. Meanwhile, the main telecommunications service provider in Guyana, GTT, has repeatedly stated that there is no existing monopoly, especially since Guyanese have choices when it comes to the internet and mobile providers and data providers. GTT has in the past complained about Digicel's bypassing of its fiber optic network and instead using connections from neighboring Suriname. Let's tell you now that residents in the Essequibo region will now have access to their own radio station as the government continues to roll out its regional community stations across the country. Today, Radio Essequibo was launched by President David Granger, who noted the importance of access to public information. So it is in recognition of the size and the potential of these regions that we've created the RPBS, the Regional Public Broadcasting Service. 
And I must congratulate, I joined the Prime Minister in congratulating the team, Enrico, Robin, and other members of the team, who over the last couple of years have extended the Regional Public Broadcasting Service. And not only the hinterland uh, capital towns must have the service, but also the coastal capital towns, because there are some, some coast, coastal regions which don't even have capital towns. Um, uh, so we must ensure that the broadcasting service and the information it provides is accessible to all residents. Under an initiative of the President, several radio stations have been opened in communities across the country. Although those stations fall under the National Communications Network, persons from the regions are trained as announcers and operators, and programs for the regions are produced and aired, as well as programs from the city are retransmitted. Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu has been overlooking the implementation. Our radio system, our communication system, when the form of internet con connectivity around the country must be devoted to enriching our mind, to make us, Im to imbue us with patriotism, sense of nationalism, the love of our region, the love of our country, the pride in our country, as well as in our regions. Radio Essequibo is broadcasting on the 95.5 FM bandwidth across the Essequibo County. Well, after squatting in small wooden shacks and private property at the corner of Broad and Lombard Streets for years, 20 families yesterday received the keys to their own homes, thanks to the Department of Housing and the Food for the Poor organization. Food for the Poor was contracted by the Department of Housing to build the low-cost homes for the residents at Prospect on the east bank of the Marara. The move came following a court order for the residents to move from the private property where they were squatting. Many of them were elated yesterday after receiving their own keys. Feel happy, feel proud. And I can't even overstay, it just feel nice. Well, today is a beautiful day for me. It's so beautiful that I didn't even eat before I come out. <laughs> I just left the tea. I'm just anxious for come here, get back the house because my house burned down in the last fire day. So I just thankful that I get back, brand new one, land, looking good, feeling good. Government officials who were present for the handover said the Central Housing and Planning Authority had to step in to render help. That your government is one that caters or cares for the well-being of its people. Your government did not neglect you. We stepped in at the appropriate time to render the much needed assistance which you required. Your government believes in family being together. That's why all other agencies apart from CHNPA played a role in working with you over the past three years. Not only to change your lifestyle, but to orient your mind from being a squatter to a true landowner, quote and unquote. The houses are outfitted with some basic amenities. An $8.5 million playground was also commissioned in the community. Another 31 homes are slated to be constructed at Cummings Lodge shortly to assist some more squatters. The Ghana Police Force today issued wanted bulletins for three Lindeners who are all accused of rape. While details of the rape allegations were not made known, all of the cases are related to incidents that occurred in Linden. The statement from the police force named 30-year-old Wayne Orlando Sawyers of Stuart Pat Christianburg Linden as one of the men wanted for rape. He is a suspect in the alleged act of rape which occurred in May of 2019 at Blueberry Hill, Wisma Linden. 26-year-old Tevin Richmond of South Amelia's Ward Linden is also wanted for questioning in relation to a rape allegation. He is fingered in an incident that is alleged to have taken place in May or June of 2019 at Phase 3 Amelia's Ward, Mackenzie. The third bulletin was issued for 53-year-old Kelvin Mackenzie of Max Strand Street, Blueberry Hill. He is wanted for an alleged act of rape that occurred between the 28th and 29th of September at the Buckton Creek and Blue Lake in Wisma Linden. The Ghana Police Force is asking for anyone with information about the whereabouts of these three men to contact the nearest police station. 
you can also call 911. The police force says the information will be treated with strict confidence. At the Georgetown Magistrates Court today, a 49-year-old driver was charged with the rape of a 12-year-old girl. The accused Orlando Fraser of Pike Street Kitty was not required to enter a plea to the indictable charge when he appeared this morning before the Chief Magistrate Anne McLennan. It is alleged that on the 10th of June 2019 at Pike Street Kitty, he engaged in sexual activity with a young child. The man is reportedly known to the young girl and her family and is alleged to have carried out the sexual attack after picking the child up from school. The accused was granted bail in the sum of $270,000 and ordered to appear in court on the 3rd of February for the continuation of the case. Still in the courts, an 18-year-old fruit vendor who was warned by his mother about being in bad company was today charged with murder. The accused, Leon Patterson of Beefield Sophia, is accused of murdering North Ramblet resident Daryl Brady during a robbery. The incident occurred in October last year. Patterson was not required to enter a plea to the indictable murder charge when he appeared before the chief magistrate this morning. He is the second suspect to be charged in the case. The other suspect, Terence Pitt, remains on remand. North Randolph resident Daryl Brady was in his home on the 5th of October last year when he was attacked by two masked bandits and shot in the region of his stomach. The men reportedly gained entry to the house through a window and were in the process of carting off a number of items when they came face to face with the homeowner and attacked him. In court today, the accused was accompanied by his mother, who complained that she is disappointed in his actions and explained that he has been in and out of the court with various matters since he became 16. The accused has been remanded to jail until the continuation of the matter next month. Across the region is coming up next. The voting process. Once you have been identified as the elector you claim to be, you would be given a ballot paper that is stamped at the back top and bottom halves in your presence. On the ballot paper, provision is made for you to vote twice. Once at the top section where you vote for the party of your choice in the general election, and once at the bottom section where you vote for the party of your choice in the regional election. Make your mark in the box provided on the right of your choice. After you have voted, fold the ballot paper as shown by the election official. Dip the first joint of your right index finger in the ink provided and place the ballot paper in the ballot box that is there for this purpose. You would then have to peacefully depart the polling station. For more information, contact GCOM on 225-02-7729-223-9653, email pro at gcom.org.gy or visit GCOM's website at www.gcom.org.gy. You're out of a job, right? I am. How long have you been in construction? What's your experience? Show me how hard you can work. That's it? We'll call you. Sir, I'll be tempted to touch you if you don't step back. Sir, kindly remove from the premises. Sir, you're making me hot. Please remove from the premises. Come on, sir, give me some more. What is that? Give me more, I want more, more, more. I want to see that. Mm. It's a sexy for this job. Sir, this job requires muscle power. What do you have? Flexibility. Uh, 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 this job requires that you work long hours, hard hours. We are legions of men standing strong, but never too proud to stoop and help someone. We must send a clear signal to all. Do right. Walk in upright ways, knowing that's what being a man is all about. And ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing. Stand strong. Be the one to live right.
Across the region right now, Jamaica has restricted travel between the island and China due to the outbreak of the coronavirus in the Asian country. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton made that disclosure yesterday during a press conference. He said persons in China who wish to travel to Jamaica will be asked not to come to the island. And he said Jamaicans with plans on traveling to China will be asked to postpone those plans. The health minister said that the issue has already been discussed with the Chinese ambassador to Jamaica. Meanwhile, he also called on persons who returned from China during the last month to present themselves to their doctors for assessment. Still in Jamaica, a third earthquake has struck the island. According to the United States Geological Survey, the 5.1 quake hit at around 9.51 this morning, northeast of Lucia, Hanover. The quake was reportedly felt in sections of western Jamaica. Today's earthquake was recorded in the same vicinity as the two others that rattled the island yesterday. A powerful 7.7 .7 earthquake struck at around 2.10 yesterday afternoon. Shortly after, a 4.7 earthquake hit off land at around 124 kilometers northwest of Lucia at around 2.39 in the afternoon. And finally tonight, international news. The whole world needs to be on alert to fight the coronavirus, the head of the World Health Organization's Health Emergencies Program has said. Dr. Mike Ryan praised China's response to the deadly outbreak, saying the challenge is great, but the response has been massive in China. The World Health Organization will meet tomorrow to discuss whether the virus constitutes a global health emergency. The Chinese city of Wuhan is the epicenter of the outbreak, but the virus has spread across China and to at least 16 countries globally, including Thailand, France, the US and Australia. More than 130 people have since died in China, and close to 6,000 have been infected. There is no specific cure or vaccine. A number of people have recovered after treatment, however. And that's your News Source Evening Bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley, reporting.